Hey, welcome to the first Wisdom Warriors podcast. Today, we're talking about democracy and some of the ideas of our founding fathers that I find so interesting. This podcast is more geared to cultural philosophy, whereas my normal videos are more towards personal philosophy. Now, cultural philosophy is fascinating because we live in such politically driven times where we're going to see this rapid descent and collapsing of empires and also the birthing of new ones where political philosophy can actually be applied. And furthermore, I think just the ideas of past great thinkers and also the examples of ancient cultures when it comes to how to organize society and how to organize life to create high culture is probably one of the most important questions we can ask and one of the most important conversations we can have. This channel is dedicated to the exploration of how to create high culture externally and internally. So thanks for joining me. I'm Christian. Uh, you can sit back, you know, put this on while you're driving, while you're doing something. And let's have a little conversation today. This podcast was inspired by recently watching the first three Star Wars movies or re-watching them. And if you haven't seen them, definitely go check them out. They're very powerful stories, but also I found them to be quite a documentary for what's going on in the world and how tyrants manipulate public opinion and manipulate democracies to rise to power. I'm going to give you a brief recap of the first three Star Wars movies um, before moving on to our discussion on democracy. Palpatine is a senator on the Galactic Senate, and the Galactic Senate is this republic where every star system and planet in the galaxy sends a representative to help make overarching, you know, political policy. Palpatine is a senator and he wants to rise to power. He wants to rule the galaxy. How does he do this, right? He funds the Trade Federation to essentially create a coup on Naboo, this, this peaceful planet, and to terrorize the people. He funds a terrorist organization, essentially. And all this chaos is happening on this planet and the, se the Senate isn't able to act quickly enough to solve it. Palpatine's like, hey, we need more executive power. We need to remove the current chancellor and maybe put someone like me in charge who can actually take sweeping actions. And the Senate's like, yeah, good idea. So Palpatine gains some power, right? And then in the preceding two movies, he continues to create problems. He continues to create create war through his terrorist organizations that he's controlling, right? So he's creating these terrorist organizations and creating this galactic civil war. And he's constantly going to the Senate and being like, hey, for the greater good, look how good of a guy I am. I'm creating this greater good, this greater peace and security for everyone. I just need a little bit more executive power to make that happen. And he continues going back to the Senate until the, his master stroke moment. In his master stroke moment, when he, when he isolated his adversaries, the Jedi, right? And he's like, hey, the Jedi are actually your enemies. They are secretly working with, you know, the dark forces. The Jedi are trying to take over the Senate. They're trying to kill me because the Jedi knew he was the Sith Lord at that point, right? And he's like, you know what we need to end this war and to end the Jedi? We need a new empire. And that is why I... And founding the new empire, you know, of, of the galaxy. And everyone applauds, right? And then Padme, Anakin's girlfriend, says, so this is how liberty dies. To thunderous applause. And I was like, wow. How applicable is this story to our world? And no one sees this. I don't want to go off on any, like, conspiracy tangents here, but... Take a step back and realize that there are psychopaths who want to rise, who want global domination in this world, right? And these psychopaths, what they do is they create a problem. They create a reaction in the demos, in the people, this polarizing issue. And to solve this polarizing issue, there needs to be more executive power to, to give a solution, right? And they present themselves as the good guy, as the champion of the demos, of the people, right? And they're actually creating the conflicts. This is like the US creating Al Qaeda so that we could go into the Middle East. This is like whoever's creating Hamas right now in the Middle East in this Palestine-Israel conflict. 
So many people jump to supporting one side or the other and moralizing it. Oh, I'm so virtuous because I'm anti-anti-Semitic and I'm anti-colonialism and I'm anti-oppression you know, uh, oppression, and I'm a, I'm a champion for the victims. I'm pro-Palestine or I'm pro-Ukraine, right? And they immediately jump to one polarity or the other. And this is exactly what tyrants want. They want to manipulate public opinion and create danger so that they can gain power. And this is how democracies operate. Democracies in, this, in the second half of their life cycle often are, cre are constantly creating states of emergency so that they can create more power and resources in an upward flow towards psychopaths at the top. And this is the problem with democracy is democracies are ruled by the mob opinion. And unfortunately, the mob opinion is very easily influenced. Just look at someone like Edward Bernays, right? Who wrote the book on manipulating public opinion and was employed by the CIA and so many other, you know, faculties of government. The mob generally is whipped up into riots, into groupthink, right? And this groupthink often is willing to sacrifice liberties for securities, oh, there's this cold going around, this flu going around, right? And now you have to stay inside. You can only, you're only allowed this much time outside. The deeper problem here is that danger creates upward flow of resource and power when it's mob rule. Democracies will always end in tyrannies in some way, even if it's a hidden hand. And that hidden hand right now is corporatocracies and some kind of something. There's something there, there's some Palpatine, maybe you know, or have an idea of where Palpatine is sitting. Leaders rise to power based off how popular they are. It's a popularity contest. And to gain popularity is easy. You just have to be clever and less based than everyone else. You just have to like make lies and pander to the lowest ebb of society. And that's how you gain power in a democracy. This is a huge problem because if we take a step back and rationally look at how a society should be managed, We'd all probably say we want the best and the wisest people to lead. How do you make that happen? That is the question of almost every philosopher ever who dabbled in politics, is how do we have philosopher kings rule? All of society should be set up in a way to produce philosopher kings, because if there's a wise and good king, if there's a wise and good leader, everything will prosper, everything will flourish. And that's the bottom line, is societies are, in fact, set up in a way that tyrants, the cleverest and most debased people will rise to power and usually psychopaths who want nothing but power, especially in the latter cycle of, of the lifespan. There's a famous quote that I really like. Um, I think it's from Jefferson. And it goes that anyone who is willing to trade uh, freedoms for safeties deserve neither. Democracy only works when each citizen is sovereign and engaged. And we're going to get into the founding fathers' ideas of how to actually create a successful republic. And their ideas worked for a time. We're going to get into that a little later in the video. But right now, I want to talk about why democracy may not be the best solution for government. And the crazy thing is, is we're all trained to fight for democracy. In fact, democracy is worshipped. Everything in the past hundred years is about, you know, protecting democracy and making the world safe for democracy and, you know, combating like tyranny and all these things. And democracy is the worst tyranny of them all. So let's read from a little bit of Will Durant, my favorite historian, on his views on Nietzsche and aristocracy. So democracy means drift. It means permission given to each part of an organism to do just what it pleases. That means there's a lapse of coherence and interdependence, the enthronement of liberty and chaos. It means the worship of mediocrity and the hatred of excellence. And how can a nation become great when its greatest men lie unused, discouraged, and perhaps unknown? Such a, such a society loses character. Imitation is horizontal instead of vertical growth. Not the superior man, but the majority man become the model. 
Everybody comes to resemble everyone else. Even the sexes approximate. And men become like women and women become like men. Will Durant. Let's unpack this a little bit. And not the superior man, but the majority man become the model. Look at Hollywood movies today. Who are the heroes? It's usually your average Joe guy. Like, and it's usually, especially masculine roles are carefully dumbed down, softened. In Marvel superhero movies, they're always made to look like a buffoon in some way. Not like a stoic, assertive, strong, courageous man, right? Not a noble man. The noble heroes of the past, in fact, are being ripped down in all ways. I had a poster of George Washington on my wall and I had a friend come over and she's like, why do you have that up? I hate that. That's like the image of colonialism and, you know, the destruction of native land and native people. And I'm like, oh my God, George Washington and all of his friends fought and died for what they believed in for a new vision, a progressive idea of how they could create a flourishing culture, right? Based off the values and the beliefs of that time, yes. But nonetheless, they fought and died for something, for the freedom that we have today from like this, you know, uh, monarchical rule. And it's just an example of how our heroes have been tarnished and replaced with the average man, the, the softened man. And On the other side of that, all these strong female leads in Hollywood movies, right? They they exemplify masculine virtues and masculine qualities and emotional suppression and like stoicism and lacking the the maternal nurturing instinct. And it's so true. Nietzsche 200 years ago was like, yo, at the end of democracy, the sexes are going to approximate and and the average man is going to replace the superior man. I think we're living in his prophetic vision right now. So the core foundation of liberal democracy is always going to create cultural conflict and degradation over time. And we're going to get into why now. And we're going to contrast democracy with monarchy. So I want you to imagine owning land. And imagine owning this piece of land that you're going to give to your children's children's children that you're going to have and you get to reap the benefits of its production and, you know, what it exports, this land, right? You, get to, you live on there, it's your kingdom. How well would you take care of that land? Would you invest in it? Would you, you know, make sure that there's good balance in the ecosystem? Would you make sure there's good balance in the relations of everyone who lives on that land? Would you treat it well? Probably because you own it. Contrast that with renting a piece of land. I'm renting this house. I have a backyard that is just in ruins, basically, because I know I'm leaving in a month, right? I don't want to clean up the backyard and invest my time, energy, and money into making it beautiful. I don't invest into making this rental space beautiful beyond what is functional because I know I'm leaving soon. And that's just the reality of everything. When you have a rental, you drive it like a rental. You don't treat it with a lot of loving care and make sure that it's productive and, you know, uh, valuable to your kids, 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 right? Democracy is like a rental. We have caretakers that come in for short stints of, of, of power, right? And these caretakers aren't thinking generations ahead. They're thinking towards the end of their term four years away. And because of this, they're willing to make, they're willing to do anything to uh, basically humor the populace and make decisions that are going to increase their polling numbers. They say they're going to, you know, redistribute wealth. They say they're going to do all these things that are going to satisfy the masses, right? And then they, you know, get, acquire all these debts and print all this money and just pass it on to the next person because a strong economy is the number one thing that's going to influence polls. So they're not thinking generations ahead. They're thinking not even 10 years ahead. They're thinking in the next two years, how, am I, how do I gain popularity? And this is a tragedy on so many levels. Warren Buffett, the most successful investor, we all know him, Warren Buffett, he invests most enthusiastically in family-owned companies. Why? Because they're thinking about how their grandchildren will benefit from this business project, right? 
He invests in family-owned companies and privately-owned companies, very rarely in publicly-owned companies, because the public opinion is going to create short-term thinking. And this is what democracy does, right? Especially democracy divorced from private land ownership. We're going to get into private land ownership here in a second, but consider this. Would you let your internal world be a democracy where every vice and voice gets an equal say in what happens? That would be chaos. That would be literal self-destruction. All those vices and weak, weaker voices getting the say. In fact, the internal world, the best you know, organization of it would be into a benevolent dictatorship or a benevolent monarchy right? Where the strongest, best, and greatest voice leads. You can't make decisions based off what all these voices are saying and make them strong and good decisions. Just like a president can't say things or make decisions that everyone's going to dislike, but it's going to be great for generations to come. Like perhaps stop printing money, stop acquiring more debts, right? No one's going to like that, but that's going to be beneficial for generations to come. It's the same thing inside. And I think how we organize our internal world of voices and how we organize society should be a reflection. So when we're thinking about political philosophies, apply them inside. And if they work inside, they might work better outside. I want to read a little bit of the thoughts of our forefathers. And to to be quick here, Socrates, Aristotle, Francis Bacon, Nietzsche, Plato, like most great thinkers despised democracy or approached with extreme caution. Almost all of them universally because they agreed with Nietzsche, you know, is the death of excellence. John Adams writing to John Taylor, the, some of the founding fathers said, remember democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes away, exhausted and murders itself. There was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. It is in vain to say that democracy is less faint, vain, less proud, less selfish, and less ambitious or le- uh, than aristocracy or monarchy. Another quote, this one from James Madison, another founding father, said, Hence, it is that democracies have always been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found on incompatibility with personal security or the rights of property, and in general, have been short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. It's amazing, again, how much we worship democracy today and how it's vaunted as this unassailable kingdom. When in reality, even the people who were creating it were like, yo, we got to be wicked careful with this one because it might be the best model we have right now, but it's majorly flawed. How did the founding fathers create safeguards to protect democracy and the essence that's going to progress their nation towards something higher and more beautiful than ever before. How'd they do that? It was rooted in three things in Thomas Jefferson's eyes, and that is private ownership of land, virtue, and uh, participation and influence in self-governance, right? So small community sovereignty. These three things I want to unpack a little bit. Private ownership of land is what allows man to think long term. This is going back to the monarchy idea. To have a successful democracy, you need to have essentially each individual as their own king. And when each individual is their own king on their little kingdom, right, all of a sudden they're thinking far ahead. Their time preference extends, okay? Their time preference extends. When you own something, you're like, hey, I want this to be beautiful and nice for my kids. And I want the production and the value of this property to be to ever be increasing, right? You're thinking very long term. And when you're thinking long term, you're willing to make sacrifices in the present for the future, right? This is this is so key. And right now, what's happening is we're moving into a society of renters. Companies like BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street and their like subsidiaries are buying up single family homes all over the place, right? 20% is what I heard recently. 20% of single family homes are owned by these mega conglomerate corporations. And that's only increasing. It's going to be 50% a couple decades down the road, right? We're creating this society of renters. And when you're a renter, you don't give a shit. 
about, you know, suffering now to make something beautiful later. You don't care anymore. You're much more geared towards uh, pleasure and gain now. Just like our democracy, it's, it's, gained, it's geared towards economic growth and pleasure now at the sacrifice of the future. And that's not how you build a strong tower, right? So in the society of renters, our time preference shrank and it continues to shrink because we don't believe that we're going to own something and that it's going to be fruitful and valuable for generations to come. We're disconnected from the land. So private land ownership is essential because people have a say in their community. And that brings us to the second point, and that's self-governance. <clears throat> a society like Athens <clears throat> and the original states of America flourished at first because people had felt so engaged in the political sphere. They felt like they had influence. And that's because there wasn't a lot of federal power. There was a lot of community power. The states held a lot of power and the local governing bodies also held a lot of power. So you could actually go make sweeping changes at your community court, at your community Congress, you know, whatever it is, you can make bigger changes. And when you're engaged in political discourse like that, where you actually feel like you're, what you say matters, all of a sudden you're much more engaged in society and helping society. You're not like, like other than these activists, like, yelling on the streets like how much do you really have a say in what happens almost none because that's such a high level now like i don't participate in, even in the local elections because it's basically meaningless maybe if i had children in school it would be a little different but we have such little participation in the governing bodies that why like why even pursue p political philosophy and deeper thought and then be engaged with my community when nothing that I do matters. It's the same mentality with renting, nothing that I do matters, right? And the third thing is virtue. Virtue is best uh, founded on a higher belief on religion originally, right? And again, here we see the death of God, the death of religion, the death of religious faith, and with it, the death of virtue, the, de the death of objective truth of right and wrong, good and bad, what is, what is base and what is noble. And this is what democracy does is it eliminates, it, el it, uh, it makes the playing field equal, right? And in doing so, you make everything equal. Like there is no more right and wrong. There is no objective truth. There's no higher order of beauty and power and meaning and love, right? And without that, virtue dies. And as virtue dies, again, now life is even more meaningless. Why does it matter? Why does being a virtuous man or woman even matter for my life? Because my life's not connected to my community. My life isn't connected to future generations. My life is this atomized, isolated cell. And this is where we find ourselves today. We have lost private land ownership. We have lost participation in government and we have lost virtue. And with these three losses, society is gonna collapse. It's only a matter of time. It could be a year, it could be 10 years, it could be 30 years, but it's gonna collapse because we have lost the meaning to be great. We have lost a purpose that initially lit the fire in the founding fathers, that lit the fire of every great conqueror, revolutionary, visionary, someone trying to create something freaking awesome. And this goes back to having uh, George Washington, you know, this heroic picture of him leading this army across this bay. And why people despise that image now. They despise that image because they see him as a hero of something they no longer believe in because their beliefs have been dragged through the muck and everything is meaningless to them. And they don't feel that portentous destiny, that fire brewing inside of them of like, hey, this is the way to go. This is gonna create flourishing. This is gonna be beautiful. No, we're, we're so nihilistic and materialistic and comforted because we're again in the death throes of an empire. And not many people see this. We have lost the, the original intention and values that our founding fathers stood up for and died for. And this is a catastrophe. So that's why democracies will fall. And our democracy is in its death throes. Now, I just want to leave you with a couple tangents on maybe moving forward and on monarchies again. 
So moving forward, I see this great opportunity in decentralization, in ideas like Bitcoin and what they stand for. In since we've become so atomized, right? People are actually seeking community. And thanks to the internet now, we can actually find people that are truly like-minded and, and kindred, right? We can find actual families in a sense. And we have this opportunity to create decentralized communities, perhaps first online and then in the real world. And with decentralized money and also decentralized political power, there's a couple ways I want to make a whole podcast on decentralization, but in my mind, I'm just like, okay, what's the solution when everything's going to shit? And it's like, well, if we can create decentralized communities, this would solve almost everyone's problems because all the woke liberals and like, you know, gender ideologists can like create their own like gender utopia and see what happens. And then, you know, everyone who's a Marxian can go create a socialist utopia and see what happens. And everyone who's a traditionalist can go tr create a traditional society and see what happens. And everyone who's maybe, you know, an arist ar aristocrat, like, proponents of aristocracy can go try that and see what happens. Whatever your political ideology, you can literally create a community and give it a whirl. And I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating times in history if we could actually make that happen, because we could actually apply political philosophy quickly and see and, and get feedback on it, right? And see what works, what type, type of meritocracy, what type of democracy, what type of aristocracy, what type of monarchy is going to work best. That is so fascinating to me um because so many people have terribly flawed ideas when it comes to politics when it comes to political philosophy and yet they have a fucking instagram story and they just share all this all this bullshit right that is unthought of regurgitation virtue signaling how fucking informed they are when they know nothing and i'm just like i wish y'all could just all get together and see how catastrophic that turns out please <laughs> On another note, Peter Turchin is this ecologist turned economist turned natural historian and brought models to history. And he's someone I also want to make a podcast about. And Peter T Turchin saw that the, the birthing of nations and new ideas at the forefront, like George Washington sailing across that bay, like, you know, the Greeks after they defeated the Persians, Nations flourish and thrive and grow fastest and produce the greatest, you know, evolution of culture when they're on the frontier and the frontier, meaning that there's space to expand into and intense adversity, intense adversity. In fact, the number one thing that predicts the, uh, the life, the lifespan of a nation is how much personal responsibility each person has invested in the whole. Right, so a place like Sparta, for instance, was insane amounts of personal responsibility, um, and that's why you know it flourished for a time. So nations flourish when they're on the frontier and they're against an adversary. When there's an adversary, an us versus them, this is where you know basically like the idea that war is the father of all things. Now this is kind of to the detriment of the decentralization idea. Because without an us versus them, without like, we're a breakaway society creating our own beliefs and this is our opposition, without opposition, there isn't enough fire to fuel growth, which is really interesting. It's like, you can't practice a football match. You got to play a football match to really know what it's like and to get better at it. Um, so th that idea of how do you find a frontier again? And how do we create a frontier again? That deserves more thought. Um, the other thing that leads to the flourishing of a nation, the flourishing of a new people is wasabia, which is group shared feeling. This is so important. You look at this, the founding of America, you know, even when ancient Greece banded together to defeat the Persians, you look at the, the beginning of Rome, there was intense wasabi in the founding of every empire and civilization. And it's this shared feeling and collective vision. It's almost like being convicted by a destiny as a people, like the Germans in World War II. They were convicted by this destiny, although it might've been flawed in leadership, they were convicted by a destiny. And wasabi grows when you're on the frontier. 
when there is like, hey, we are convicted by this vision and destiny, we need to overcome these problems. And this might be a solution to the, to the war issue is our problems today are against the world and the degenerating nature of the world. And we can actually create wasabi and shared group feeling by creating something new, like some kind of society, some kind of breakaway idea and decentralized idea that we have high group feeling and shared participation in. Wasabi is what, is what leads to a healthy nation. And now we look at America, for instance. There is zero wasabi. There is zero vision for where we're going. There is zero shared group feeling and participation in where we're going. Like everyone is at war with each other in, in many senses. And many people are just in the middle and just like, you know, topped out because they, they don't care anymore. They don't own a house. They don't own land. They're not participating in their local governments. Like they don't have, they don't believe in where we're going. They think it's at the end too, right? And there's no more wasabi. And the lack of wasabi is one of the number one indicators that the nation is about to fall. So with that idea, I want to close this conversation on why we may be at the end. Thanks for watching Wisdom Warriors. This is the first podcast on cultural philosophy. We dug into a lot there. Let me know where you want to go deeper. Also, if you want to join me and other men growing together, you know, coming into our most flourishing and excellent lives. I got a new men's group, link in the description below. Thanks for being here. Click here for more podcast episodes if you're in the future and I'll see you around. Peace.